I'll start, make it easier on everybody. Yeah? Um, so on the weekend, we did a little equine assisted learning. So equine is horses, and we, God used the horses to show us how much he loves us. Now, I know it sounds kind of bizarre, but in the, in the way that he did it, um, he used the person who trained the horses and the horses themselves to just show us how he comes and he comes to help us trust him, like the trainer helps the horse to trust her. And in that place, he's very gentle, he's very loving, and he's very patient and very forgiving. But there's still places where we're not, we're not ready to go there yet. So he's patient with that, and he waits. It's a very vulnerable position to trust, because you can't get hurt. And a lot of us have fears and hurts in our lives, and we try to protect ourselves. Horses are the same. The trainer gently, gently, gently helps them to trust. And that's how God comes with us. He gently, gently, gently helps us to trust Him. He, he came in His baby Jesus. Can't get much vulnerable than that. He laid His life down so that we can come to Him, so that we can trust Him with our lives, with everything we've got. And so through this, a lot of women got something from God specific for them, and very specific. It's very personal. It's just the way God interacted with them. And they're just going to share a few of these things. I know what I've got to say. <laughs> okay, I'll make it short and sweet because otherwise I'll probably cry. But what God has told me is courage, mm. trust, and walk with Him. Mm. So thank you. Uh, it was an awesome weekend. I just can't begin to explain how wonderful it was and Trisha's vision, God's vision, whatever he did for us, he did it individually um, and with a purpose. Um, my experience was uh, a trust in God, especially we, uh, we went up on a... Um, it's called the power fan and it's a 13 metre pole, just, I don't know how tall a 13 metres is, is that as tall as the ceiling? It's probably as, yeah, it's about three storeys high. Anyway, we climbed. I'd never done this before. We were harnessed, so it was all safe. We had helmets on, so if we fell, there was no chance of us getting hurt. Um, but it was just knowing that as I was climbing, I just felt the harness and as you climb up, the pulley pulls you. And I got to about 25 of the rungs up, which was almost there, not quite, and I looked up and I was puffing and I thought, how much further? And the next thing I thought, I've just got to keep going. And the next thing I felt was the harness pulling me. And as it was pulling me, it was almost like God saying, come on, you can do it. There's only five more steps before you get to the platform. And that's just just that was my experience. It was just God saying, yes, you can trust me. I've got you. If you fall, I've got you. Yeah, that was it. I didn't do that. <laughs> but I went to the weekend, which was pretty big in itself because I've been quite unwell. So I think I know that somebody was praying hard for me, Trish. But I want to say, for me, the weekend had two really significant things. I rode a horse for the first time and that was just really, really special. It was a real, what Trish did, she really made, created a retreat that connected us to all of creation, not, not just sit in front of the Bible and feed each other words. It was a really holistic retreat, if I can use that daring word. Um, the other thing that really, for me, was incredibly significant is I've been a part of this church years ago and we've come back after being in a different in another ministry for a while and I've never really got to know people so well for lots of reasons but the retreat was such a beautiful time of really getting to know people I think all of us got to know people and we got to know people that will be friends for life you know so it was just really special and it you know and that's God that we we often think God is 
some ethereal thing, but I think connection to each other is truly lovely. So for me, they're the two significant factors. Excellent. It was a fabulous weekend <clears throat> and lots of things made it good. The, the things that was set out for, for us to get closer to God certainly happened and for me, as Trish said, uh, dealing with the horses and seeing how they relate to people who are wanting to help them. The, these folks are so loving and caring, but some of the horses just need to get over that fear, that, that, that um, they're just being scared of coming near. And, and as Trish said, that's an, an analogy of how God deals with us. And as long as we just drop our fear and pick up our faith in him. For me also, I love the horse riding. I love the powered fan, although like Ida, I had some trepidation going up. But the whole place was surrounded by, by this sense of sisterly love, but also God's love. It just emanated from that place. So it was a real... It was a real time of resting and sharing with some beautiful women. And that's the other thing, that often in our busy lives, we don't get time to talk to people. So on this weekend, we were able to do that. Thanks. Good morning, everyone. Um, what I love from Rit Rit is uh, sharing um, stories with other ladies and also the activities that we did so and also like you can see the connection of yourself and God and you can see it in the creations so what happened there is when Terry I think uh, she is a horse trainer and then she's saying that before the horse uh, goes out and then you know the, have some riders on them they have to prepare the horses so they will do five minute walk five minute trust and this and that for the horse to be prepared so from there I could see like myself sometimes I was asking God like Lord <laughs> like it's so difficult why do I have to go through this but then I rebuke myself and I remember God is preparing me for something bigger and another thing is yeah doing the power fan so at first like I will just think that the only time I will struggle the struggle there is from uh, stepping off from the ledge so when I was climbing and Miriam was right because she already said that when you're already there like three-fourths of the climb as if you want to stop but uh, I, I, I told myself that oh, I will also struggle in climbing but I said no uh, I will just think that I, this is a challenge I have to finish it and then once you already reach the platform I said this is it this is another struggle and I said to God uh, that time I took a moment and I said to God okay Lord I'll just count one to seven and I'll jump I'll give everything to you so from there from that activity I also saw myself in God like even though uh, I know that it's a safe activity there's hardness it's still like the same when I have difficulties, I know God is in control, God is powerful, He's perfect, like, you know, like, you can trust Him, but still sometimes we have this difficulty in trusting Him. So, that, that's what I feel like, I have difficulties in trusting Him, but the good thing is, the best thing is, He's helping us to trust Him. So, I really praise God to the, having that read read. So as you can hear, um, it was really faith over fear, every drop of it. Nobody was forced to do anything, everybody did everything volunteer, and four of these ladies up here did that leap, and um, I'm not one of them. Um, <laughs> couldn't make it up that pole. Uh, uh, it was just 
amazing how God came and God ministered and just to watch that and to hear what each one was getting back individually as you can hear very different and we just praise God that he loves us and he's gentle with us and he wants us to trust him because he is trustworthy thanks Corinthians chapter 13. Do I have a reader? We do. Uh, Hi. The reading this morning is from 1 Corinthians chapter 13 verses 4 to 8. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy and it does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude and it is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no records of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil but rejoices with the truth. It always protects and always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails, but where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. Okay, are we ready for the word today? We've got more water coming up the back. Does anyone want another bottle of water? Just put your hand up and Jake will bring one to you. There's Bill and a few. Jake, thanks, mate. Maybe someone can give Jake a hand up the back there. Dave, would you be able to jump up and give Jake a hand? So just keep your hand up and Jake will, or Dave. One for Maria in front of you there, Jake. One for Miriam down the front here. Bob, Craig. One for Melanie. Yep, Melanie down the back there. Thanks for sharing, Melanie. There's a heart of a preacher in you. I reckon maybe we have to nurture that. Who's got an amen for that? There you go. Any more hands up? One down the front, Miriam. Okay. So last week, uh, for all, all the, the women who weren't here, or if you weren't here last week, let me just uh, bring you up to speed. We're doing a series on um, the house that Love built, and we'll see the first slide up there. And uh, this is kind of what we did last week. Let's see. Thank you, Jake. We are at one. I didn't have to raise my hand. Isn't that great? I love my sons. They are so awesome. We got it? There we go. Maybe the sunshine makes it a little hard to see, but you can see there's a, there's a church building there with nobody seated in it. And today, let's look at the second one. Okay. The church that love built. And so just to a quick wrap up of what I did last Sunday so you know the context of what I'm looking at. I shared with the church just part of uh, Trisha Meyer and Zach's and Emma's journey around England and Scotland and um, of some of the magnificent uh, cathedrals or abbeys that you walk into that literally take your breath away. And if you've been there you know what I mean. It's just it's hard to, to create adjectives that would describe it well enough because we're so free these days with our adjectives. So you say something's beautiful, but then you see something more beautiful, and you can only say it's more beautiful before you can say it's more, more beautiful, and that just doesn't make sense. Isn't that right? It just doesn't make sense. And, and, but it's just, just beautiful, but there was plenty of places that we walked through uh, that were either abandoned, uh, which means uh, they were demolished, and they were ruins, or they were now being used for another purpose, i.e. a bar, i.e. a club, i.e. a uh, gym, i.e. a party house where you go there to get all your party equipment. Okay? And for me, there was this sadness about seeing these buildings that are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years old being used for something completely different, but still seeing that they are a church. 
and, and this moment of revelation on the trip, and there were a number of them, but one of the, the one, the powerful one for me was standing in a place called Jedburgh Abbey. And, and Jedburgh is a place I've never heard of, but if you're Scottish, uh, you would have, because lots of kings were, were crowned in Jedburgh Abbey. But all that stands now is the, is the walls. Uh, there's no roof. Um, and there's a, there's a floor and I, I was stood in the middle of that place just with Trish and it was a freezing cold morning and there was, we were the only two people there and uh, I closed my eyes to pray just to say, Father, would you give me something today and, and all I could hear was a crow and if you know me, these things mean stuff to me. Uh, the creation itself, like you guys found with horses, there's so much that the Lord speaks through creation that at times we just go, oh, that's just new age garbage but uh, I want to say to you, the Father's been speaking through creation since the days of Adam and Eve and, and us in the West, we've negated the Father's voice because we think we have to read it rather than actually see it. Okay? That, the Word of God is, to, is just awesome and powerful and everything but the Father's voice is all around us. The Father's voice was in, in the amount of women here. Did we hear that this morning? That's the Father's voice coming through a female voice, right? And some people go, oh, that's just too close to strange for me. But the Father can speak through many things. And, and I heard this crow, and it's the, the crow in vision or dream is always a thing of death, a thing that takes life rather than gives life. And, and all you could hear in the coldness of that morning was a crow. And, and the Father spoke this phrase into me. He said, this church now is historical and not eternal. Uh, so when people look at it, they see something where God was worshipped, but is no longer. And, and so the whole site has a story, and you can walk through it, and you can get headphones, and, and you can walk up to different things, and they'll tell you what is, that is and what it was used for. But it's all historical. It's no longer eternal, uh, because the things of God have stopped there. And, and this phrase of, of it's historical and no longer eternal, they went further to say, this is what happens when one generation goes missing. Okay, one generation of believers goes missing, the church stops. And, and so, and if you, you can see that in Sydney. There are, there are plenty of churches in Sydney that have closed down because a generation has gone missing. Okay, we've stopped engaging with what God's got us on this planet to do, and, and all of a sudden, it's a place where God was. And when people come, they remember that but they don't experience the power of who God is. Make sense? So you guys went down to Atunga last week, which is in the, out the back of nowhere, uh, and there's no phone reception down there or anything like that, but you found God even though you didn't have your phone. Is that right? Probably found him more because you didn't have your phone, right? Uh, and, and so God spoke, and I know some of you ladies, just even through the horse's eyes, like, uh, and like I love riding horses too, it's a newfound passion of mine, and, and there's something about connecting with, with, a, with an animal of that size, and you can feel love if you want to start looking for it. Now people would say you're crazy for that, but hey, take the time. Isn't that right? Touch the horse, find out for yourself, okay? It's like climbing up that power fan. It's 13 metres high, so just to context, the top of our roof here from the floor is 9 metres, uh, and so there's another 4 metres above that, and they've got a harness on, and they come up to a platform where there's, there's no railings. You just step up there, and you step off, right? You step off. And by the time you land, they've pretty much got you nearly stopped, but you've got to free fall it for probably at least half of that, and all of a sudden it... it pulls you up and, uh, and some really graceful landings, let me just say, I saw the videos. <laughs> right, I saw them. I had a good laugh. And maybe with some of your permission we could show them. <laughs> what happens on retreat stays on retreat, right? So here's the, the challenge for us as a church, okay, not to go missing in action, not to disappear. Not to think that we've arrived, not to think that we know everything, not to think that we have all faith and that we can just keep on doing the same old, same old, because the Father is calling us to grow and, and engage and act in this community and this generation, because if we go missing, what does the next generation stand on? Memories. Okay? And that's all it is. Memories. And so when you go to England or to the UK or Europe, any of those places, Ireland, that are ancient old, there are many memories that are myths. Are they, are they not? 
Seamus and Sue, there's many memories that are myths, and, and some of those, like, like King Arthur, and they become stories that all of a sudden people take hold as real, but they're just myths because somewhere along the lines, historians went missing, and maybe there was an Arthur, and maybe there wasn't, but hey, there's got to be a Genevieve, right? And there's got to be a Lancelot. So let's just put that together and make a story. And before you know it, people think it's truth. Okay? Uh, so the story of Robin Hood, same sort of thing. You know, uh, William Wallace in Scotland related to me. I'm just going to keep saying that. I'm so proud of that. Related to me. Uh, William Wallace, his, his wife's name was Marion. He stole from the English to give to the Scots. Does that sound vaguely Familiar? Maybe. And so truth, if it's not recorded, if it's not been put generation after generation, it becomes myth. And if it becomes myth, it starts disappearing and we start holding on to the greatest things rather than all the things. And that is the same with church today. The kingdom of God here today needs to engage in the moments to know that it's not just a greatest hits reel that just keeps on playing of how great God is. He actually wants to meet us in our places of fear when we're 25 steps up the rung, rung and not 30. And he's there saying, oh, Ida, you can do it. You can actually do it. And I'm going to give you the strength and the courage to do it. And before you know it, Ida is stepping off into places she has never stepped before. Why? Because she has confronted a fear that tried to keep her on the ground rather than climbing a pole to step off into a place where she is trusting something that she cannot control. Is that worth an amen right there? She is breaking through fear because she is taking those steps to do something about it. When we come to this passage of scripture in Corinthians today, it's like they have got themselves into a rut of what makes them feel good, right? And the Apostle Paul comes along and says, you know what, this is not a greatest hits reel that people need to see. They need to see what it looks like when love all of a sudden seems to be a strange place to be. Anyone been in a relationship like that? No? Oh, okay. So you guys all have fantastic relationships where you've never had an argument. I came across a, a couple one day, and they said to me, I've been married for 15 years, I've never had an argument once. Never. Never. I said, praise be to Jesus for that. How do you do that? And she said, well, my husband's a, a baker, and he gets up at 2am. <laughs> I still think it's a miracle. Like, it's really, like, come on. Like there's always healthy discussion, can we call it that? But, but there's this thing with the church and, and when Paul gets to it, they've got this greatest hits real playing. We're prophets, we can speak in tongues, we can, we can communicate with the angels, we can do all these kind of things and the Apostle Paul goes, all oh, that's awesome but it's got no love and when it's got no love it means absolutely nothing to the kingdom of God. Okay, that's what we looked at last week. You can speak in the tongues of all over the planet. You can speak in the tongues of angel, but unless you've got love, it sounds like a clanging gong. You can have faith that moves mountain. You can be prophet. And you can know all the things of the kingdom, and you can understand the plans of the Father. But if you've got no, no love, well, you've got nothing. You can give everything you have to the poor and be charitable, but if it's not done with love, again, Paul goes, you've absolutely got nothing. And so what he's saying to the Corinthian church, which I believe he says to every generation, there are great things that you can do. There are wonderful things that you can do but unless they are motivated by the common statement of love guess what they're not going to build the kingdom okay you can go away with 24 other ladies and you can do all that kind of stuff but if there's no love there you don't have testimony up here is that right ladies is that right if there's no love in that place you don't have people going up and saying awesome you have people getting up there and saying gee I just would have valued some more time by myself does that make sense love came to town, if I can use B.B. King as my uh, source. The Apostle Paul steps up and says, this is what love looks like. If you want a definition of love, th this is what it looks like. And he just rips it, this is it, love is patient and kind, love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude, does not demand its own way. There's a killer for people in it, doesn't demand its own way. Wow, that's one for our generation right there. Love does not demand its own way. I think that's such a powerful statement. It's not irritable. It keeps no record of being wrong. It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up, never loses faith, is always hopeful, and endures every circumstance. And if you go down one more verse, it says, Love will last 
forever. And Paul says, you want to know what love looks like? It kind of looks like this. It kind of looks like this. If you go back into the book of Luke, one of the things that my Bible study is doing uh, this year is going through a whole bunch of parables. Okay, so if you're keen to get involved in that sort of space and understand parables, 7.30 on a Thursday night out in the chapel, you can come be a part of that. But the first parable that we looked at last week was this. A, a, a good tree can't produce bad fruit. Can't happen. I love that reality. A good, tr a, a good tree can't produce bad fruit and a bad tree can't produce good fruit and it says whatever comes out of your heart, whatever comes out of your mouth is evidence of what comes out of your heart and he's likening that to the good, tr good tree and, and, and the good fruit. And, and the word fruit in scripture, it, it's kind of like this, uh, it's like your signature. It's kind of who you are. You know when you started your signature and how embarrassed you were by your first signature? Remember that? I've got a name Beckenham, right? It's got a lot of letters in it. And, and you've got to try and put that in. Yeah, you've got Jock and Mabono over here. That's ridiculous, right? <laughs> isn't, that, isn't that right, Maria? Like you married into the family and you changed your name to Jock and Bono and you've just gone, how do I write a signature with that? Right? But it becomes who you are. It identifies you. And like when you go to the bank, they want to know who you are. And these days it's a pin number, but back a few years ago was your, your signature. And you worked hard at it. And I remember when I was in year four and, and I, I, like people were saying, you've got to have a signature. And I really liked my teacher's signature. His name was Mr. Marsh. He had an M. And I thought, you know what? I've got an M at the start of my name. It's not Meckenham, it's Beckenham, but it's Matt. So I thought, I'm going to use that. So I plagiarized his signature. Of course, I thought it looked cool. And I thought if I had a cool signature, then people are going to think, hey, this guy's got it all together. That's a lot to think about when you're in year four, I'm telling you. Right? Isn't that right? Who remembers back that far? Yep, yep, Michelle does. And like, there's a few guys, you remember that? And like, you wanted, you, what defines you to actually make, uh, that's, that looks cool. That looks cool. And, and, and so the, then the M is great, but the Beckenham is ridiculous because it's, it's so long. And, and if you look at Trisha's signature, you won't even find Beckenham in there. There's just these swirls and, and it's just, poof, there it is. And, and like, okay, that's her signature. That identifies who she is. But it's like that with Scripture. It's like that with the kingdom of God. Your character is your signature. So the fruit that comes from you is, is your signature. Does that make sense? So like when I say to, that pe to people when I'm in uh, like ministry or counselling, like often people self-reflect and they go, oh, wow, because there's so much that comes from me that's just bad. There's so much that comes from me that's just poor. And I just want to encourage you with that. You're human, and you've got to start somewhere, and that's okay. The whole thing with the kingdom of God is he doesn't just wave a magic wand and go, boom, you're Jesus. He just brings you and guides you and leads you just like the ladies found with the horses in this way that just presents you more and more and you discover more and more of him. And as that faith grows inside of you, before you know it, some of the fruit that you think is sparse, sparse is all of a sudden becoming multiplied. Okay, so again, the fruit that comes from you that is of the kingdom is good regardless of whether you you say it is or not. Can I say that? Okay. Sometimes you think everything that comes out of your mouth is just average and poor, but God says, you know what, I just see you and I love you and there's going to be things coming out of you yet uh, that already are, that there's fruit, there's a signature, there's something about who you are. And the Apostle Paul has got this, this beautiful passage in 1 Corinthians 13 and he says, this is the signature of any church and this is what he sees and this is what he desires and he believes it's come straight from the Father and there he is giving it straight there to the church. And he says, this should become your signature. Is that right? It's, it's patient and it's kind. It doesn't demand its own ways. It, it forgives it never gives up. It always endures. It's always faithful and it's always hopeful. That's the signature of a church that doesn't go missing in action. And we may not do all of that awesome every single time, but that is our goal. That is our desire. That is what we would love to see happen. Like, let's say this, Trish goes away on a Friday night. And when you go away on a retreat, it's the same with men's retreats. You, you, you're trying to get everything together. You're trying to make it all happen. You're hoping the traffic is not going to be too bad. People People are going, oh, I don't want to do this and I don't want to do that. And, you, and, and, and then all of a sudden someone gets sick and they can't come. And, and all of a sudden there's all this stuff and you're going, God, where's the fruit here? And he just says, wait for the last five steps. And when you get to the top, I will show you what I'm about to do. 
Does that make sense? Don't give up. That's a signature of love. Don't give up. Don't let go. Don't lose faith. Don't lose hope. This is the signature of love. And so we live in a society, in a world where the signature of love actually looks like what? So today's Valentine's Day, yeah? You know when the last time Trish and I celebrated Valentine's Day? Have a guess. Yesterday. And we're doing it again today. And tomorrow we celebrate it again. Isn't that romantic? Isn't that... Well, what do you reckon, Bev? Is that romantic? I'm sure Stan does the same for you. It's the same deal. Like, you've got to celebrate it. You've got to grow in it. If you get stagnant in it, if you're going to wait a year before you can actually show your wife or a person in your life that you love them, you're waiting too long. There's a tip for all the young guys in the room. Take it every day at a time and make sure that they feel like your Valentine and they are experiencing that, you are, that they are your Valentine every single day. And before you know it, your relationship is going to be this beautiful signature that looks like patient and kind and never giving up and it's never never hopeless it's always hopeful it's never faithless it's always faithful and if you can see that in the relationships that you have on this planet you are going to be able to encounter it with the relationship you have with your father amen father in heaven that's why retreats work so well when people desire i'm not going to give up I'm always going to be in faith. I'm going to bring hope wherever I go. And forgiveness is going to be something that is who I am. So we live in a society that tells us that once a year, Valentine's Day, and it's ridiculous. You go to the shops, and how big are the teddy bears in shops? And the pressure you feel as a guy. Like you see one guy, and he pulls this big teddy bear up, and that's 150 bucks. But there's a bigger one, and I love my wife more than that teddy bear. And so you go and find the $200 version of that teddy bear. Guess what happens with that teddy bear? The next council pick up, right? <laughs> Isn't that right? Or it sits in a room, and it gathers dust, and when you pick it up, it goes, Poof, and all of a sudden you get hay fever. Is that the kind of love you want to give to your wife? No, right? No. So don't go with the whole concept that I've got to spend money to make her feel loved. Spend time and you'll make her feel loved. The whole concept with the Father in heaven, he says, I love you so much that I'm giving up my son, time with my son, so we can be on this planet with you to show you what love looks like. What love looks like. The Father in heaven didn't go missing in action, nor should we. Nor should we. One of the things that I think that Paul gives to us in this passage, like Jesus talks to Peter and he says, I give to you the keys of the kingdom and Satan himself will not overcome you. And that for generations the church has gone, what are those keys and where are they? Let me find them because I want to use them. Well, Paul just says, here they are. And because at times as humans we're so unforgiving and resentful and fearful, we refuse to believe that those keys will help us open up the kingdom. Who hasn't been hurt? We've all been hurt. Who hasn't been rejected or abandoned or betrayed? Like, it hurts, right? And for those that love you that do it, oh, there's not a pain that you can describe. Like, it's like describing the windows in one of these stained glass uh, cathedrals. There's not a word that you can say. It's like the opposite when you've been betrayed by someone you so deeply love. There is not a word that can say it. But Jesus goes, I know it. And I can feel it. And I want to show it to you. And here's Jesus going, I'm not going missing in action. And I want you to see it, that there is a path that's not impossible. There is something that the kingdom wants to do in your life that will show to you there is a place in this, in this world today where love can overcome, where love can become a signature that kind of looks like this and doesn't look like what the world wants to give to us. I hear people say to me, Matt, I just want my partner to make me happy. I said, you're selling yourself short. It was never happiness God has called us into a relationship. It was love. And love overcomes sadness. 
Love overcomes weakness. Love overcomes all these incredible words that we find so hard to deal with, like rejection and betrayal and abuse and all these incredible words. But God says, will you trust me to step off that platform and know that I'm going to catch you? Will you trust me to know that I'm going to continue to pull you up? Will you trust me to know that I'm going to meet you even in a paddock where there is a horse that looks into your eyes and declares something that nobody else gets? Does that make sense to you? There is something of the kingdom that's wanting to speak into your life and your world today. It doesn't have to happen here, and I'm really happy that it does. But you know what? God's voice can be heard and seen. But if we go missing, if we choose not to listen, then we're going to be like a a church that goes missing and still wondering where God left the keys to the kingdom because I just never found them. And God's like, they're in the male blind spot. They're right in front of you. Anyone got a male blind spot? That's when things are right in front of you and you just go, where's my keys, where's my keys? And Trish goes, they're right there. Mm. I think that the father thinks that about the church at times too. You're wanting to know the secret and the father goes, it's not a secret. You've got to love me and love others. It's not a secret. Jesus didn't just say that. That was said all the way back with, with Moses, right? It's not a secret. So what do we think it's a secret for? And, and there Paul is going, you think the keys to the kingdom look like you grandstanding, having this highlight reel, and that everyone's going to go, awesome, how great are you, because God is obviously with you. And, and, and Paul's like, and God is with us all. And, and just because some people can't speak in tongues or just because some people can't prophesy or because some people can't heal, it doesn't mean God loves them any less. It's just that we've got to engage with the place where God finds us and that's when we discover the power of what God has got in store for us in the kingdom. Does that make sense? I'm not romanticising it for us. Uh, you know, when... Valentine's Day comes around and cards say I will climb any mountain I'm yet to see one man do that I'm going to swim an ocean that's ridiculous but, but we sing it don't we like it's just we'll do anything like, really you'll do anything okay and I tell you I can't tell you how many times couples have sat in my office and I, one would say to the other I will do anything and I, I said anything well yeah within re- no 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 do you see what's happening do you see what's happening? If, but love speaks through those places. Love forgives through those places. Love endures. Love is hopeful. Love, all these things, this is the signature of what love is. So if you're looking at your life and you're self-reflecting right now and just going, wow, none of that describes my life, well, here's the kicker and here's what I love. God designed you to be with him. And the Bible says this, God is love, right? And so if you're trying to do life without him, you're trying to do life without his love, his uh, holistic, great words, so his holistic love is wanting to impact in your world. And if you're trying to do life without his love, then all of a sudden you're going to be a clanging gong. Is that hurt? What do you reckon, Lily? We're going to do life with love. We're going to let this fruit, this signature, uh, this the, that comes from the tree that is healthy, it becomes healthy when we we discover Him and walk in Him and desire for more of Him. Uh, and all of a sudden, God changes and God transforms, and the Bible becomes this amazing place of truth because the Bible tells me I am a new creation in Him. And before you know it, you're going, "Hey, I am. I am." a new creation in him and that's because I need him I can't do it on my own I don't know about you but I've tried it long enough on my own but with him all of a sudden you get five or six different stories do you not and there are more stories here like if I got Lisa up here she'd just about die but uh, you'd do it when you Lisa there'd be something for you to say is that right you got something to say right now okay uh, if I got Bethany up here, she would die if I asked her to say something, but, but she wouldn't die, but she would, you know what, the, you can hear in her voice that God's doing something, can we not? Can you hear in her voice? Or was that beautiful this morning or what? Right, There's, God is doing stuff in that place. It takes us to engage with his spirit to say whatever love looks like, that's what I'm committing myself to. And before you know it, this is the church that love built okay 
So you're feeling down yourself right now? It's cool because you need God. You just need, you need him, right? That's, that's the whole phrase. And he will show you. He will lead you. He will talk to you. He will speak into your spirit and you will see the transformation happen with your own eyes. But here's the beautiful thing. You're not the only one who witnesses it. Everyone else sees what Jesus does. You can't keep that to yourself. Let's just pray together. Um, we're going to get the worship team up and we're going to do some singing. And so, Father, we just thank you that you are a God who uh, shows us a love that is beyond our comprehension and but is here. We thank you, Father, that even when we feel like we don't have enough love or we just aren't loving enough, it's you that comes alongside of us and said, that's why you're here. You are the one who makes us whole. We need you. And so, Father, in this day, uh, and even when the world celebrates a concept of love that focuses on one day, I just want to pray that there'll be something inside of this room this morning that will burst from this day. Uh, like we heard with the, the women who just spoke our testimony of what God had done on a retreat away, Lord Jesus, I pray that inside of this room, voices will be raising up to speak and to say something of the kingdom of God. And so that in the days and the weeks that are ahead, Father, we just want to speak over a church that love will continue continue to flow from it, whether it is spoken from the front of the church, whether it is around a coffee table, uh, whether it is in a neighbourhood or a workplace or a school, whatever that is, I just want to pray, Father, more of your love, more of your love, and Father, that we can have more of you. And so, Jesus, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the Apostle Paul. And I thank you for his strong words that he's spoken to a church. And I know, Father, there are times, many times, where we need strong words spoken into us to wake us up at times and, and to, to see that you are at work right now. And so, Father, we just rejoice with you speaking through your creation last Sunday. We rejoice with you speaking through your word. And we rejoice that you're speaking through your people today. So, Father, today... Come and let love abound in this very room. In Jesus' name, amen.